Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight, um, especially given the snow. Um, and thank you for uh, quickly accommodating us as we move this event online. Um, so you are here for the Criminal Lawyers of Color panel hosted by the Dalhousie Criminal Law Students Association. Uh, this event is in partnership with the Dalhousie Black Law, Black Law Students Association, the Dalhousie Indigenous Law Students Association, and the Dalhousie Asian Law Students Association. Uh, so all four of our groups have worked together to find the panelists for this evening and to create questions um, that will be asked. Um, just for reference, my name is Sierra Mateo. I am a 3L student and the current co-chair of the DCLSA. Uh, first, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Dalhousie University is located in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. Today and every day, we are all treaty people. So tonight we will be joined by Brandon Roll, who is Senior Legal Counsel at the African Nova Scotia Justice Institute, uh, Yan Liu, Crown Attorney with the Nova Scotia Public Prosecution Service, and while we were supposed to be joined by Michael William McDonald, Mi'kmaq lawyer, um, he unfortunately is not here currently, but if he does join in, um, I'll be sure to note that as well. Um, so without further ado, I am more than happy to turn this event over to our moderator for this evening, uh, Faith. Hi everyone, so I'm Faith and I am part of the Criminal Law Association as Careers VP, but I'm also part of DALSA as External VP and I am going to be moderating, moderating our panel today. So I'm going to start off with kind of a general question and any of the panelists can answer any question that I bring up unless it's specified to a specific panelist. Um, these questions were made in um, conjunction with all of the societies, and here we go. So, um, for either one of you, did you see yourself practicing criminal law when you started law school? And if not, what was the path you took to get here? I can start. So, um... Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's too bad we uh, weren't able to to be together in person, but uh, I'm glad we were able to pivot and, and do this virtually. Um, I definitely did not see myself practicing criminal law when I was in law school. Um, in undergrad, I took a kinesiology degree. So at that point, uh, I thought I was going to be a gym teacher, you know, nine to two summers off seemed like a good career. And then I had uh, Michelle Williams, um, former director of the IBM, IBM initiative, come to Acadia to recruit uh, for the IBM initiative. And uh, she sort of stirred something in me to, um, I guess, uh, help me uh, think about law school. And I ended up applying, getting in. And even when I got in, I thought um, sports agent, you know, that's that's a really cool job that you can do if you have a law degree. And then the further I looked into that, I realized it was mostly just contracts, <laughs> which wasn't my favorite. So I didn't have a ton of criminal law experience throughout law school. I did criminal trial practice, which was really cool. I didn't end up getting in any of the clinics, which I would highly recommend having been on the other side of that as a mentor. Um, so my, And then I articled at a really small firm that did real estate law. And so that was a great way to figure out that I didn't want to do real estate law. And so my first real exposure to CRIM came through a small firm called Newton and Associates. And it was uh, really well-regarded lawyers uh, who did a lot of CRIM work. And they actually had the, the sales contract in Dartmouth. So anyone who came in and was seeking bail, um, you know, our firm took care of that. And, and it was really eye-opening in terms of being on the ground in the court every day, uh, seeing people at sort of their, their highest level of need. So crim law was attractive to me in law school. I didn't really know what it was to practice criminal law until I started doing it. So I, I think that would be one of my suggestions to, to folks if they're interested is to actually get out, um, shadow, volunteer, go to court, see what it's actually like to, to practice. But I, I fell in love right away because, um, you know, first of all, I don't know why everyone went to law school, but for me, it was this fundamental idea of helping people. And, and that really came to life in criminal law. And, you know, there's a, there's a beginning and an end. So in, in some place, you know, some places in the law, like family law, for example, it's, it's very difficult subject matter, not that crim isn't, but in family law, to me, it seemed like, wow, this can just keep going, you know, on and on and on. And, and crim sort of had that defined beginning and ending. Um, and so that, that appealed to me as well. And even though you might get 
a hundred theft under files, you know, let's use that as an example. Every file is going to be complex and nuanced and different because of the people that are involved. So it's really sort of just this exciting field uh, to me anyway, that, um, you know, I've never lost interest in. Wow, thank you so much for that answer. And what about you, Ian? Uh, so for me, definitely not. Actually, when I started law school, I said, I don't know what I want to do, but I know I definitely don't want to do crim a criminal or family. So I'm eating my words now. Um, so I, so uh, Brendan, uh, and I don't know each other, but I know you by name, Brendan. Um, and I didn't know that you had a background in kinesiology. My degree is actually in physiology, my undergrad degree. So also life science. So, you know, law was really not very much on my radar at all. Um, and then after I did my undergrad, I worked for a number of years in uh, the community. So I was doing outreach work with immigrant and refugee um, populations. So uh, just doing like support work for folks. And then eventually I kind of made my way to law school, but I still wasn't really sure. Like I applied for social work programs. Um, I just thought I wanted to go back to school, right? And then I kind of made a decision the summer before law school to pursue law instead of like counseling psychology or social work, the other things I was thinking about. Um, and then once I started law school, I again, didn't know what I wanted to do, except that I thought that I wanted to avoid both criminal and family law. And then I ended up getting hired in the 1L recruit for a summary position, which I just, um, summary position. Um, I just applied just to, to try to see what would happen. And then I got hired by one of the corporate firms in Halifax. So then I was kind of on that path from that point. Like I had my articles, um, you know, planned out there. So actually throughout law school, the only course I ever took relevant to criminal law was like criminal law in 1L. And I took evidence in 3L. So that's it. Um, and then I did some mooting. I did a competitive moot and did the compulsory moots, of course. So through that, I knew that I liked litigation, like realized throughout that process that I enjoyed that. Um, but beyond that, like I really didn't know uh, what I wanted to do. There's no lawyers in my family. I'm a one and a half generation immigrant, which means that I immigrated to Canada with my family, but when I was a child. So it was really just, you know, I didn't know anyone in law school didn't uh, know anyone really in the profession so just figuring it out myself so anyway so um did my summary throughout law school and articled um and then after that was looking for a change looking for something different um so I actually took some time off after that just to like um like heal psychologically from law school and from articling and then I saw this job posting come up at the crown's office and at the time there's, and I thought, okay, maybe I'll try working for government. Maybe I'll try getting out of private practice and all its ups and downs, et cetera, and try working for government. And I remember at the time there was this posting at the Crown's office and there was a posting at DOJ. So the civil litigation side and that the DOJ posting, I was going to apply to it. Like it, you know, I wasn't leaning towards crim or civ one direction or the other. And it was just that the DOJ posting was like a little while later, the deadline was a little later. And I entered at the Crown's office and then I got this offer for this job. So that's how I ended up here. So really a very um, winding path. But um, I mean, there's ups and downs to what I do now, but I do enjoy it. And I find that there is an immediacy to it. Like there's a relevance to criminal law that you don't see so much in civil law or civil litigation. And I think that aspect of it is actually much more similar to my background and where I'm coming from, my work experience like that aspect of helping people and, um, you know, what I was thinking of when I was thinking of pursuing social work and so on. So yeah, I have more thoughts, but I'll try to I'll try to keep it there for just the first question. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, it's it's actually very interesting because a lot of the, the criminal association, I think, um, from 1L, they are like, oh, criminal, criminal, criminal. And then you see all of these practitioners who don't start off with like criminal law backgrounds or criminal law interests, and then they end up in the Crown's office or legal aid. So that's really interesting to see. Um, another question that we have here is, how does your position as a person of color lawyer impact your approach and strategies in criminal law? So. I mean, it's an interesting question. I think we all come into the practice with, you know, our identities. And and for me, that's that's part of my identity. 
um, being black and uh, growing up in Nova Scotia, um, you know, it's not something you can be separated from. So I think you come into the practice with a certain lens through your life experience, but uh, it was also bolstered for me by, um, you know, the IBNM initiative and, uh, you know, some of the profs like Michelle Williams, who sort of infused this idea um, about educating us about the real historical context in Nova Scotia and, and the relationship between African Nova Scotians and the law here. And so you come out of school uh, sort of feeling this duty to give back to community. And that's really been an enriching part of my practice. So it informs it informs my practice every day. It informs, you know, the way I look at files. It informs how I talk to crowns, how I try to persuade judges, you know, what I look for in files, how I deal with clients, how I listen to clients. Um, I think it's a, it's a huge part. Uh, of my everyday practice. And uh, I think more and more that's being infused in sort of the general education at law school, which is a good thing. We're learning about critical race. And, you know, I think uh, there's an argument to be made that the law itself has has sort of perpetuated uh, systemic racism. And, and it's, you know, our collective job to try to remediate that. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the answer. And Dan? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think, you know, who you are dictates everything that you do and both how you approach it and how other people approach you, right? And um, how other people see you. So I think being a racialized lawyer um, or, you know, having that intersectional identity is a real benefit to me. And again, in like the immediacy um, in our work in criminal law, just like the, the closeness, like these are really things that affect people's lives. Um, and I think having, you know, whatever your intersection is, just having any kind of lived experience that separates you from like the dominant culture, like that narrative, right? Like having experienced any kind of oppression based on your identity, I think allows you to be open to understanding the experiences of other people who have had, you know, other challenges, even if those aren't things that you've experienced themselves, right? Just like having that um, lived experience, having that lens, that competency from your own life, um, you know, it doesn't have to be uh, like a, an exact match, right? Someone who's experienced the same things as you, but I think there's um, definitely an advantage uh, perspective there, which is why it's so important that we don't, um, you know, that we have real diversity in, uh, in firms, but especially in like the Wade and the Crown's office. So we don't just have like a bunch of white guys. Um, and that's the, the whole thing. Right? Yeah, I, I really love how you both framed um, that question into more of a positive experience rather than how some people might view it as a negative experience within the legal system and in law school in general. A lot of people find it very difficult to be in that situation with all of the different lived experiences because it sets us apart, but it also does make us have a different perspective in some ways that I guess is almost. Um, not able to be the same for others who haven't had not had not had those experiences so thank you so much um a kind of funny little question here was what are some common misconceptions about practicing criminal law yeah, that's a great question i think one of the things you know, even in my, I have three young boys, so even in my household, this this conception that there's good and bad, you know, the police catch the bad guys, or if you, even if you're in defense work, you, you feel like you're doing work for the good guys, but really we just operate in this gray area that's all about context and circumstances and people's lived experiences, so that was a real um, eye-opener for me, um, you know, the extent to which there's there's always a different side to the story and um you you do really have to stay open to that the other piece that caught me off guard was the um the amount of people management that goes on like really you have this idea coming out of law school that oh if i know the case and i know the law you know that's all i need and it's really most of the job is managing client expectations, negotiating with crown attorneys, if you're defense and, and vice versa, persuading the judge, you know, oral argument, um, 
coming up with a bail plan and reaching out to family members to coordinate that. So there's just a lot of people management skills that really, if you can sort of master those or, or get good at those, at least, um, you can be quite an effective advocate on behalf of your client. Of course, the law and the research and preparation is, is always going to be important. Um, but yeah, that was, I, I think, a misconception for me, at least coming out of school, is that, you know, if you know that side of it, the law and the argument, uh, you'll be fine. But it's uh, much more than that. Um, yeah, I would definitely echo what Brandon said in terms of um, it's kind of all encompassing. There's more to it than just the law itself. And I feel like that's more so the case in criminal law than in the civil bar, which where I don't have a ton of experience, but I did have you know, my articling and summary experience there. Um, it's an interesting question. I was thinking about it, misconceptions. Um, honestly, I don't know what, what conceptions I did have before I got into this. So everything was a surprise in that sense. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the actual experience of doing this job, right? I think one thing is um, it's very, um, like you, you need a wide skill set and as a crown. Um, and you need to be able to handle a lot of different things coming at you at the same time. So a typical day in court where you have the docket, so you might have like a few trials on the docket, some matters for sentencing, some status for plea, et cetera. It's a lot of people who are showing up who have been subpoenaed that you have to deal with. So you have to manage them, meet with the people that you need to, go down to court um, so you can talk to the judge and you know to ask for more time to do something, what have you. And then uh, something might come up where you have to research like a point of law or call someone to try to figure it out. Um, so it's they're very intense days in court in that sense and very demanding on uh, several different fronts. So not just from uh, the legal side, but also just like logistically and emotionally handling everything and trying to make the experience, um, you know, as palatable as it can be for, uh, you know, complainants or witnesses, um, folks who are there. So it's very, it's very demanding and there's a lot to it. And I think it's a very human endeavor. There's a lot of humanity that is on display on a typical day in provincial court. Yeah, for sure. And it also is the most, um, you know, the most court time that you'll have, I think, um, you know, as a, as a new lawyer. And I feel like, I mean, Brandon, you can tell me what you think, but I feel like crowns are in court more than defense counsel, maybe. Oh, <laughs> maybe, I, you know, when I started at Legal Aid, I was in court pretty much every day. So it's it's different in terms of, you know, the approach you, you you might come into court with four or five boxes of files and I might come into court with 10 files, but that's 10 people, you know, who you've done all the sort of background work with. Um, so, yeah, it's different, but the exposure is amazing. I guess I would say that um, I would add probably that you're you're not going to see a lot of those moments in court where you catch the witness sort of lying on the stand, you know, those aha moments in court sometimes and they're great when they happen, but it's more of a grind, you know, it's a steady build towards the argument that you're making and, um, you know, there's a, a few of those moments, like I said, but it's not uh, like what you would see on TV, but it is the best part of the job because it's so dynamic because, you know, you're, you have to be quick on your feet and you have to react to how the witness is, is answering questions in the box. Things always come up the day of trial. There's last minute negotiation. So it's sort of this really exciting environment. And I don't know, provincial court is also just a bit of a zoo <laughs> generally, it's sort of wild in there. And so it adds to this dynamic of, you know, it's high stress, but it's also kind of exciting, kind of fun. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, hopefully rewarding. Honestly, when I saw this question, I thought that you two would answer with, there's actually some money in criminal law and it's not like all bad over here. <laughs> like, I think a lot of uh, students have the misconception that you cannot make money in criminal law. And I have learned the opposite from a lot of criminal practitioners. And they're like, no, you can, there's some stuff here that you can have a very solid base uh, for financial reasons. So I was like, I was thinking of that one, but <laughs> I guess no one else uh chimed in with that one <laughs> um, on that point I mean since you since you raised it and perhaps it is on other folks mind as well um I can you know I can't speak for legal aid or I think it would be different um working in private practice as defense counsel but certainly at the crown's office um the the pay I mean it's uh it's all um 
know, publicly available. So you can just search for the Crown Attorney's Agreement, Google it, and you'll see it. But uh, we negotiated a few years ago, the Crowns went on strike. I don't know if, if uh, you guys know that, but to bring um, the, uh, the pay for junior counsel to have some parity with the, like the larger firms in Halifax. So the pay at the Crown's office is certainly comparable um, to those. So yes, that would be a misconception if you hold it. Yeah, and um, you know, the, one of the benefits uh, as well, you know, if you're working at Legal Aid or the Crown, are you know the vacation time where you can take sick leave. If you're in if you're in private practice, it's sort of at the beginning, especially you have to um, eat what you kill, essentially, and um, you know you're expected to to run that side of things. There really is a business component as well, which some people are really good at. I wasn't the best at it, you know, especially you know tracking people down for money wasn't my forte, but. Um, yeah, you can definitely make a good living in criminal law. You know, I don't think that's a reason to go into it, but you're not going to starve. Um, there's lots of work out there. And if you're fortunate enough to get on with, you know, government or quasi-government like uh, the Crown or Legal Aid, um, yeah, the pay, is, the pay is good and it, it rises every year and the benefits are great. So there's some stability for sure. Thank you so much. And yeah, going on about skills. Um, what skills or qualities should a young criminal lawyer begin to hone early on? Are there skills and qualities that would specifically benefit BIPOC individuals? That was an interesting one. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think you do have to be sort of a fierce advocate um, because you're going to run into people saying no to you, especially when you're new, they don't know you. Um, you know, like I said before, a lot of this job is sort of persuading people uh, why they should believe you or help your client. So um, persistence is is key. Um, preparation, that's that's just for everyone. But, you know, be over prepared. Your reputation really does go a long way. It's a small bar. And so people know that if you come to court and you're sort of ready and you know you make excellent submissions or you're on top of everything you know the next time that they talk to you that conversation goes a little bit better because they've seen you and they've seen your work and they know that you value your reputation so i would say be aware of those things for me uh, coming in you know as a black lawyer there wasn't many of us and so you do feel under the microscope a little bit and um you're you're sort of breaking barriers in a lot of different ways you're for me i was interested in the areas of the law where we could bring the voice of community into the courtroom a little bit more so you're in a lot of ways sort of in the boundaries you're, you're pushing the envelope a little bit with respect to the law and so those are spaces where you have to lead and so you have to be comfortable in those leadership roles if, if you want to push the law a little bit further uh, in a direction that it needs to go um but i would say the biggest skill i don't know if it's a skill or not but find find your people right find find those folks who have common goals or common values who can support you um, in doing this work that is hard um, at times and so um knowing yourself and sort of knowing your limits taking care of yourself those are all things that i think young racialized lawyers need to be sort of acutely aware of and not being afraid to ask for help the, you know the folks at the bar in nova scotia at least you know, the senior racialized lawyers are looking for ways to help junior lawyers because they know um, sort of how hard it can be at the beginning. So I think um, find your find your community uh, as you start that work. I think one important thing to keep in mind is that there isn't like a single profile of a successful criminal lawyer. Um, that can look a lot of different ways. And there's different aspects to the job that people will be better or um, worse at or need to work on more, depending on who they are. Like, is it that human element, the interpersonal skills? Is it like the legal knowledge? Um, is it your um, court skills, like your litigation skills, you know, what have you, right? So it's, it's a mix. So I think working on both your strengths and areas where you, you might wanna improve, right? Just kind of being, um, um, trying to flesh yourself out in that sense. It's also don't think that anything, um, you know, don't feel held back by anything in your history. Like I said, like I had no criminal law 
experience. Well, I should say I did a little bit of defense work when I was arguing, but just a little bit, but I certainly hadn't taken any of the, the courses. Um, but, you know, here I am, I, like a decent, so, oh, yeah, a decent crown attorney. <laughs> you know, I'm still, I'm, I'm doing it, right? So um, there's always ways that you can, you can compensate or overcome um, any of uh, any perceived deficiencies in that sense. I think having an important sense of yourself and really feeling strength in your perspective is important. So I feel like, you know, it's like if you're uh, a racialized law student and you're here for this meeting, like you're probably not, you know, you're someone who wants to do something, you want to make a change, right? Like you're not here to just uphold the status quo. That's like not what you're about, right? I'm assuming. So doing that can be really, really hard when you're not necessarily seeing yourself in the profession or, um, you know, in the bar, or you're very rarely seeing yourself, perhaps. So you do feel it can be very isolating sometimes, or, you know, there isn't really anyone who necessarily understands your point of view or understands where you're coming from. So I think strengthening that point of view in yourself and really, really reaching and like finding that resilience. I think if you can hone your resilience, that is going to help you. Like that's such a core skill that's going to help you because it's just really difficult work. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's important for us to be represented in this work, but for those same reasons, it makes you more vulnerable in it as well. So you have to take care of yourself, like take care of yourself, take care of yourself always. Yes, and on that note, um... Criminal law is an area of law that requires a lot of emotional strength, like you said, Yan. And um, so how do you both avoid or minimize burnout in the workplace? I know that I definitely need the answer to this question. I think it's harder at the beginning because the learning curve is steep and you want to sort of prove yourself that you can do the work. Um, but eventually, I think you get to a place where you're sort of comfortable setting boundaries, um, you know, protecting your time, protecting your well-being. It is hard work in terms of, you know, we, we hear a lot about, you know, being a trauma-informed lawyer. And um, I think there's a lot of value in that perspective. I think we do carry a lot of vicarious trauma. You know, lawyers have some of the darkest um, senses of humor <laughs> that you're going to come across because you see this stuff every day. And it's sort of that's your release is to sort of vent with your colleagues and and talk about how your day went. So it was really fortunate uh, for me at, at my first 10 years at, at Legal Aid is I could walk into you know someone's office next door and just talk about what happened in court vent, um, sort of release a little bit, maybe go out for drinks once in a while to let off some steam. Um, but you find your moments to sort of gather yourself again. And um, I think it's it's so important because you do see a lot of burnout, especially, you know, I, I think we can be candid here that legal aid lawyers are overworked, crowns are overworked, you know, there's not enough judges, the entire system is under tremendous strain at all times. So uh, it's difficult. It's difficult to strike that balance. People like to talk about work-life balance, but when you come into the profession, and not to scare anyone off, but it's true, you know, and if you work at a, the Halifax office and you're carrying 200 files, you don't really have a work-life balance at the beginning. I think there is a, a movement towards wellness within legal aid and perhaps within the crowns too, I don't know. Um, but you also have to get the job done. So I, I think it's tough at the beginning. Um, like I said earlier, there, there are sort of those, that vacation, those sick days, sort of take the days that you need, um, to recover your well being. but it, it's a hard balance at the beginning and, uh, you know, saying no sometimes to, to different outside obligations, don't take on too much in terms of committee work, board work, things that you, might think raise your profile as a lawyer and that's not why people do them i hope but you know you want to give back in certain ways but it's also um it's energy and time that you're you're giving up so protect your energy and protect your time i, I think would be my biggest tips what an excellent question this is i was thinking about it like, what's my answer and then i realized i think it's it's not something that i can answer can find an answer to, right? Or maybe it doesn't, I just haven't found it yet, I don't know. But I think it's it's more, it's an ongoing process and it is very, very difficult. That's um, just the truth of it, for sure. But, you know, I think legal practice in general is very difficult, especially in the beginning, you know, for starting out. 
that's certainly, yes, the vicarious trauma and the workload. Um, yeah, the workload is a lot and it is very difficult work. So you know, I was thinking about this question. Um, so there is a saying that I really like, which is how you are with anything is how you are with everything. So I think when you're thinking about like how to be resilient, um, you know, how to bolster your emotional strength, you really have to look at yourself and have, try to have a good understanding of yourself. So whatever struggles you have right now in law school or, you know, in your life, like however that impacts you, that's, that's going to be the same if you're practicing criminal law and like whatever skills you have right now, tools that help you, again, that will be the same. So I think for me, it really comes down to self-knowledge and um, like honesty with yourself, really trying to see what that's about for you. Like, are you someone who needs to reach out to your network and be more connected? Or are you someone maybe who needs to draw some more boundaries and protect your space and have some more time for yourself to reflect? Are you someone who turns inward and is more of um, you know, like a self-sabotage or self-harm? Or are you, is it expressed outward? Do you get angry? Is that how it's expressed? Um, is it, you know, do you turn to substances? Do you, turn, what is it? Is it interpersonal? What's going on? Like, how does that look for you? Like how, you know, how is it looking for you right now in law school? Generally speaking, that's, that's going to be like, you're still going to be you, you know? So I think, again, working like I'm um, such a broken record about self-care, I think, and which I admit and, and own, and I will continue to be. So whatever you have right now that's working for you or whatever you need, you think you need help with to try to get that, that is going to be the same thing that will help you later on. Like it's not mysterious in that way, right? There isn't anything like unique about these challenges. I mean, they are in nature, but there isn't something like, you know, um, qualitatively unique that's gonna be different if you enter a different area of practice. So really I would encourage you to do that deep dive within yourself, which I know can be really difficult, but I, I do think that it pays dividends. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um... I think it also speaks to finding where you draw your strength from as well. You know, if you draw your strength from your family and friends, make space for that. But you can also draw strength and inspiration from the work. You know, there are those moments when you you have a very clear realization of, you know, why you're doing why you're doing what you're doing and why it matters. And, and so that part, I think, can can help push you along to you've, you've made a difference in someone's life or you've you've sort of altered the course of maybe um, the law in a certain way that that gives you that strength to, to take the next step. So that's a great answer, Anne. Thank you. Thank you both. And uh, we're going to go into something a little bit more about crim law procedures, I guess, now. So we're going to look at IRCAs. And for anyone who doesn't know, IRCAs are impact of race and culture assessments. Um, and so can either of you speak to any particular instances where ERCAs or GLADI reports significantly altered the course of a sentencing? Um, and do you think that it had the anticipated effect of addressing overrepresentation of people of color in the criminal justice system? It's an interesting question. I don't know everyone's baseline on ERCAs and GLADIUs. Um, I think it's important to understand the scope of the problem that we're talking about. You know, systemic racism is embedded in every aspect of our lives. So expecting a sentencing tool to effectively address that, I think, is a bit unrealistic. And we, we need to understand the timelines as well. You know, Glad you is, you know, a couple of decades old and IRCAs are really in their infancy. So I think one thing is we need to continue to give these tools the, the time to do their work. But I can say from my experience, absolutely, they've, they've been impactful. You know, you're not going to address overrepresentation in one sort of fell sweep. But, you know, day to day, I've seen, you know, these tools do their work. I'm glad I've had very impactful glad you reports, not just the reports, the entire sort of um, different sentencing process. You know, you might go to a sentencing circle and see that impact that it has because the crowns are often there. The judge is often there. And so you're presenting your client, your true client, their complete identity um, to the court in a different way. And so I've had scenarios with Gladue reports where the Crown took one position and then, you know, after reading the Gladue report or hearing my client testify, you know, came all the way down to, to sort of join me on a joint recommendation for a non-custodial sentence. That won't always be the case. You won't always get the result that you want, but that's 
you know, they're not meant to be magic. It's it's just meant to say, here is the entire person. Here's some other things that you should consider. And courts should want this information, right? I want to know why this person's in front of me. And, and if there's systemic or background factors that have contributed to that, then um, these reports bring that to light. And so their value to me is, is sort of undeniable. And um, I think we'll continue to see um, these impact the law in different ways, not just in the sentencing context. So Gladue, for example, we know that Gladue principles are applicable at bail. We could make the same argument for IRCAs. I would love, a, love to see us get to a place where this is sort of um, in trials as well, before guilt or innocence is determined. And uh, we're seeing that in different ways. I think, you know, if you look at some of the cases about after the fact conduct, you know, uh, is the is the reason that you ran away from the police because you committed the offense? Or is the reason that you ran away from the police because historically there's mistrust between the police and, and the Black community and you haven't had great experience with, with police? So isn't it open to me as the judge to draw that inference based on what we now know about systemic and background factors? So I think these tools will begin to show themselves in ways that we haven't quite imagined yet. But um, to me, they've they've certainly done what you know they were intended to do but i don't think you're you'll ever be able to make that direct correlation that we have gladue now and we have urcus now so the numbers are going to, going to immediately drop it's one step in this much much larger um, systemic problem i definitely echo a lot of that i had written down um, my notes to myself systemic and i just circled it um so i think certainly if you you have to keep uh, um be aware, aware of what your expectations are of what these tools can do and also be aware of um, you know the whole journey that someone's been on that led them to a place where they're dealing with uh, conviction right freshly sentenced or being sentenced it's not you know not completely reactive because there's of course a rehabilitation aspect to sentencing but clearly a lot of things have happened for a person an individual person to get to that point um and, you know, so it's difficult also to assess this when you're, when you are dealing with individuals and a report here and there, when it is such a systemic issue. Um, but, you know, certainly it's a good tool that we have. Another thing that I think about is, um, again, just how important it is to have representation and also to have like education and awareness because a report, you know, you're, Think you can be somewhat limited um, by the person who's wielding that tool, so to speak. So if you're dealing with folks who, you know, are really lacking some cultural competency to properly interpret or understand what's going on in the report, then it's, um, you know, that's going to be a challenge. So, but this is like not something that we need instead of, but in addition to. Yeah, I, I look at Gladue as well. Part of the issue with Gladue after it came out was that judges weren't using the tool correctly. Yeah. So, you know, the Supreme Court of Canada came out again, like 10 years later in, in Italy and said, no, you know, you this is the way that you use it. It's not only meant for minor offenses, serious offenses can be, you know, incorporated into this framework as well. So it's really about shifting um, the mindset, you know, you looking at these tools as a lens through which you apply, you know, the law. I think that's where we need to get to. And I, th I think we're heading in the right direction. Perfect, thank you so much for that. Um, we have actually a question in the Q&A. Um, and the question is, would accused persons benefit or not benefit from having hearings and sentencings online instead of in person? So. I'll maybe give a minute for you two to kind of think about your answers, but would it benefit or not benefit? I don't know if I'll answer the question directly, but what I'll say is, you know, COVID has taught us a lot about how much we actually need to be in court and for what reasons, you know, we can do an intake court. Uh, on the phone or or by video and we don't really lose much you know especially those appearances where you're setting dates I think there are some things that we have to look to right you know the criminal code tells us that for a trial really the accused needs to be there absent you know certain circumstances and you would have to make an application I think for them to be absent from a trial for example but I do think that um 
we could probably be more efficient and that that would be a tool and and really um maybe the question wasn't getting to this but it's something i think about is that the courtroom is this imposing place right you go in you walk past the sheriff station a metal detector it's sort of cold environment and everyone's talking a different language essentially you know we you know we have all this legal jargon that we use and so you don't really know what's going on and then if you are a witness or a victim or an accused and you have to take the stand you know you have someone you know cross-examining you which is never a comfortable experience so we don't make it easy for people to sort of be present in the courtroom and that can manifest in a lot of different ways you know how people react to questions if we think about a sentencing when the judge asked do you have anything that you would like to say on your own behalf you might look you know to your right and look at the gallery and see 50 people you don't know like how comfortable are you going to be expressing remorse in that scenario so i think generally we could probably do a better job making that a more welcome environment i love the the move towards sort of more plain language um, in the legal field uh, to be more inclusive, uh, you know, if we're talking about Indigenous courts and the setup of those, the physical setup and space, I love some of those ideas where the judge isn't above people and we're sitting in a circle, you know, how can we uh, make that space more inclusive, you know, so I don't know if we'll ever get to a place where people are showing up for, for trials by video or sentencings by video, there is sort of this expectation that a person will be present for important moments um, during the during the process, but um, it's a good question. So I think, yeah, it's a good question. It's interesting. There's a few different perspectives you can take on it. But one thing I would say is from an efficiency point of view and in terms of timeliness of getting, you know, uh, getting a disposition on your matter, that would definitely be to the benefit of um, accused folks and also to everyone involved, like complainants, anyone who's involved in the matter. So the idea that uh, a trial can go forward or a hearing can go forward, even if the court is on lockdown. So um, I actually did a few virtual trials. Um, uh, it was around, I think it was like January of last year. So it was when the courts, provincial court have, uh, has had a few COVID lockdowns over the last little while and then coming back and then locking down again. So that was during one of the lockdowns. And I did a couple of virtual trials. Um, it was a lot of work logistically, which, um, you know, was a bit of a deterrent. So that's unfortunate. So a lot of, you know, like non-legal work that I had to do because unfortunately the courts are um, these lumbering machines and they uh, can be very regressive in terms of technology and um, like requirements um, and in terms of those not really you know adapting to the technology that we have so it was a lot of work to get those done but I was able to do it it was an interesting experience um, but it was very difficult because again the infrastructure isn't really there currently um, to do that efficiently, although it certainly has been pushed by the pandemic. Um, but is the push over now? Are we going to continue on that momentum? I'm not sure. It depends on how optimistic you are, I guess, about the courts. But yeah. Okay, great. And uh, I see another question here. What are some prevalent issues, if any, that you've come across in your practice related to race or racism? Um, yeah, I would, I would love to know this as well. I think there are probably a lot more that you have seen than I have in my few months of shadowing in court, so. Yeah, I like to think about that in terms of stages of the process, right? So you're going to see it sort of at every step if you're looking for it. And I think that's key. You sort of have to be open to this idea um, because for a long time, the last thing that anyone wanted to talk about in the courtroom was race. You know, let's talk about technical legal arguments instead. And I think you see that in sort of in some of the jurisprudence. But if we think about the process, you know, how racialized communities are policed, over policed, surveilled, that leads to more charges, how discretion. So who holds the power in the system? And, you know, we can look to the police and we can look to Crown attorneys who have a tremendous amount of discretion. And how they're using that discretion, you know, is that informed with, uh, you know, critical race lens? And if not, why not? So we all acknowledge this problem, right? Overrepresentation at large, you know, for for Black and Indigenous folks in the justice system. And so 
the status quo is, is not working. You know, the, the process as it stands is not working. And we can tell that by the outcomes. And so you really have to go through at each stage, you know, what did the police do? How did the Crown respond? And what decisions did they make? Um, why didn't they refer something to restorative justice? You know, these are questions that you can ask as a practitioner. And then when you get into the trial proper, you know, a lot of, you know, racial profiling is a real thing. Driving while black is a real thing. These, th these things happen every day and you see them in cases. They don't present, you know, the officer's never going to say I pulled him over because he was black. It doesn't look like that, but it might look like, oh, he was driving the car of someone I knew to be a drug dealer in that neighborhood. Really? Okay, let's explore that a little bit. So I think the obligation is sort of on you as a practitioner to flag these issues, be aware of them, you know, do your research and learn about these things. So you, so you're able to raise them, be confident enough to raise them, um, you know, street checks, racial profiling. It could be something as simple as cross racial identification that, that we see all the time. You know, I, Police officer goes to a uh, theft under scene, gets surveillance video from the superstore or whatever. How do they identify that person? If they don't know them, they send it around via email to all the officers. And someone will say, yeah, I know that. I know that person 100%. I can identify them. And then you come to find out they might have met that person once, maybe, you know, four years ago. And so, you know, how can you be so sure? The, you know, the phenomenon of cross-racial identification, that's a real thing as well. So you, you just become familiar with these issues and then sentencing of course we know the disparities in sentencing uh, we know the disparities in bail conditions you know why are you asking for a curfew when this happened at at noon on a thursday it doesn't make sense so just being alive to oh okay those are certain red flags that we need to ask questions about and being um courageous enough to bring that up and being ready for the response because when you bring up racism to uh, someone who doesn't like to talk about racism the initial reaction is defensiveness well, I'm not racist, so I couldn't take that view. How dare you accuse me of that? And that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about you as an individual actor. We're talking about systemic factors that are bringing themselves to bear in this file. And how are we going to work together to address that? Because it's both of our obligations. So I think there's so many ways that it presents itself. And maybe to me, it's because I've always been looking for them. But um, I think fundamentally is, you know, have you done your best to bring the voice of your client into the process. And I keep repeating that because it's a piece that's been missing for so long. Because when people feel like you've heard them, you're not dismissing their complaints, which happens all the time. You know, I think racism uh, played a role in this case. And the lawyer might be quick to say, well, no, actually, here's the evidence the Crown is relying on. I don't think there's anything to do with race in there. But if you're looking in the right way and you're accepting what your client tells you because they are experts on experiencing racism. And so you should trust them and you should accept what they say. Then, uh, you know, I think you're doing your job as a practitioner in terms of raising those issues. It's really interesting uh, hearing your answer, Brandon, because, um, you know, when I was thinking about this from the Crown perspective, I was thinking about the cases that I've had where it was, uh, you know, like a hate crime type situation, right? Whether it was like utterances, like threats with uh, racial epithets, like with a racialized um, dimension to it, where the uh, the folks who are experiencing that, like during the branch of that are the complainants, um, you know, and how difficult it is to kind of see that through in court. So in the criminal code under uh, section 718.2, I think, there's a subsection that talks about, um, that makes it statutorily aggravating uh, on sentencing when um, a crime is, uh, is happening in the context of you know, discrimination on the basis of, and there's a few characteristics include one of which is race. So it's like a hate crime clause, right? So, but it can be really difficult to get that across in court and to, to really prove that. And I've actually seen that at, at a few different stages. It's interesting, like I've had the experience where I'm meeting with a complainant uh, on the day of the trial, like at the Crown's office, you know, talking to them with the officer there. And they're telling me things that are not in the police notes that really bring in that like racial dimension to what was said or, you know, and I'm like, well, why wasn't this captured? Um, like, why is this not, why is it only coming to light now when I'm speaking with this person? 
Um, and then I've also had the experience of, uh, you know, making these arguments in court and trying to bring that to light, like this element and, um, you know, like how damaging it is for uh, folks to be the target of, uh, you know, crimes like where, where it's really bringing to light, like it's, um, you know, like these racist um, incidents, right? And had the experience of just having that not, um, you know, be accepted at all by the court, by the judge or getting through. And I will tell you that is very demoralizing to experience. It's not always, but, you know, even one time is too many, right? It's just very impactful. Um, you know, there are moments that make me think about like what I said earlier about how if you're racialized and you choose this work, you'll have more of an impact, but you also will be more vulnerable um, in some ways. So again, it just speaks to the overall level of the degree of cultural competency or the lack thereof in the system as a whole, right? Like on the bench and with counsel and just um, with everyone in the system. So it's certainly, it can be very difficult. Thank you so much for your answers. Um, we have an answer from Debilsa specifically for Brandon on a case for Rakeem Anderson where you represented an intervener, the ANSPD PAD coalition. Um, and so they were asking about uh, what were some of the approaches you considered and how you determined the best approach from the various options that you had. Yeah, that's a really good question. So Anderson, if folks aren't familiar, is sort of a court of appeal decision from 2021, I think. Wow, it's uh, blown by. But it was this decision that considered sort of the use of ERCAs and how do we how do we use systemic and background factors and that information we receive from an ERCA when we sentence Black Nova Scotians and African Nova Scotians. And this really was interesting because it was, I call it sort of community-based strategic litigation. So legal aid represented Mr. Anderson. And then my job, along with another lawyer, Lisa Shigeri, was to uh, work on behalf of a client. And that client was the ANS DPAD coalition, which is this huge group of 30 plus organizations, many, many individuals from black communities. So sort of this voice of the community and to work with them as our client to intervene, to say, this is, first of all, really important to the black community, this decision. And, you know, here's how you should apply these factors. So we really um, proposed this substantive framework. And it really was, it's a lens through which to apply all sentencing principles. So we're not trying to put it in certain boxes, which had been the approach in some cases. We had gotten to a certain point in the law in Nova Scotia where we were prepared to acknowledge the value of ERCAs, but not really have it impact sentence or mitigate sentence. So that pathway to mitigation was the next step. And we had some cases out of Ontario that had taken that step. So the timing was really interesting because there was a case called Morris in Ontario that went to the Court of Appeal as well that was being argued at the same time. And we're working with those folks as well. And they sort of intervened on our case. So um, it was really, you know, it ties in in so many different ways. The IBM initiative, Professor Williams, Professor Dugas sort of helped us frame that work. Uh, community had input on what was important, very clear direction that the court has to know the history here. So we laid out pretty comprehensively the history in this province in terms of um, systemic anti-Black racism. We pointed out that the law itself had perpetuated that racism. And there's many examples of that in terms of land rights, voting rights, you know, these sort of Jim Crow laws that were, you know, sundown laws. There's all these examples, you know, throughout the, the course of time, how um, the law had been a tool to perpetuate this. And so we were saying, well, now the law, you have this duty almost to, to remediate this through the law because the law had been complicit in, in getting us to this point. So Justice Derrick wrote the decision, um, really hit on everything that, that we wanted. Um, you know, said it might be an error of law if you don't consider uh, IRCAs, and it could be an error of law if you don't explain your decision, because that's where we were. We were at judges saying, yep, you know, there's that history, and that's really bad, uh, but this is a gun case, or this is a serious case, and you're still going to have to go to jail. And so you, we tied it back to the problem that we all acknowledge, overrepresentation. We're you know, very clear, uh, overrepresented um, in, in the justice system at large, how do we address this? And so we were saying the law sentencing judges must play a part. Yes, we can't solve the entire problem, but clearly 
this is a place where we can make an impact. And so, uh, fortunately, um, Justice Derrick and the and the panel were unanimous that um, you know that's the way that the law was heading. And so, we are really fortunate in Nova Scotia to have that type of decision because it makes our work, you know, I work at the African Nova Scotian Justice Institute, it makes our work so much easier to say this has been acknowledged by our highest court. And sentencing judges really have clear direction now. And so if they don't follow that direction, we have recourse. So um, that was a really sort of monumental moment for me to be involved with and to, to bring community into the courtroom in that way. And so it was I would say in response to the question, how do we arrive at that approach? This is years of, of preparing for that moment and preparing, waiting for the right case and having the network to be able to respond, you know, uh, in the timeline, that's pretty short when you consider, you know, appeal timeline. So we had to sort of mobilize pretty quickly. I have to give a lot of credit to, to Lisa Shigeri too, who had this idea about, because we had to go to legal aid and say we want to represent not only Mr. Anderson, but we want to represent an intervener as well, and and they were on board with that. So we had, you know, decision makers who were ready to come with us, um, you know, as we as we took that on. And um, I think the the contextual approach is is a really basic legal you know analysis. We let's take it back to first principles. Let's say that you know because of the historical context and because of the outcomes that we're seeing. It has to be applied across the board. And I think if you read Anderson and read Morris, you would notice some of the distinctions there where they try to say it's, you know, it's relevant to this sentencing principle, but not necessarily to the seriousness of the offense, for example. I think that was one of the conclusions that Morris drew, whereas Anderson was more nuanced than that, I think, and saying, well, it can apply there, and, you know, and here's how it might. So it left the door open. And um, so I think, again, we'll see that grow into uh, other areas of the law, hopefully before sentencing. Thank you so much for that. And um, before we open it up to more Q&A, so uh, students, if you have any questions, um, please put them in the Q&A box and we will ask them to our panelists. We have a little bit of a wholesome question here. Um, what can, uh, can you describe a case or situation in your career that was the most valuable or impactful on your practice? Yan, would you like to start with that one? Sure, I think I can. Um, there isn't one particular um, thing that I can think of, but I think it's more like a collection of experiences. So I have been very fortunate to have some really good mentorship at the Crown's office um, and to have had some really good interactions and feedback on my work both from my colleagues and just chats with uh, you know, defense counsel and from some judges actually off the record as well. Um, so it's those moments have been extremely validating um, and really meaningful for me. And I think, again, this goes back to me, um, you know, my experience of coming into this profession, you know, like not seeing myself, not having any reference frame um, to it. And maybe some of you will relate to this, right? So you're sort of always looking for for feedback or for answers. It's like, is this okay? Am I doing all right? Um, especially when, again, you're trying to not just uphold the status quo, you're trying, like you believe in something, you're trying to achieve something. So I think just having that feedback, those interactions really, um, you know, bolstered my confidence in myself, um, which, you know, then in turn has really helped me in this job and in my advocacy. Um, and again, Another thing would be having really good interactions with complainants. So I think I'm a very relational person. So I think no matter what I'm doing, it's going to be about that human interaction. Like we get a lot out of that. So I think it's important to be clear on what your expectations are from your work. So what is it going to look like for you to feel satisfied by what you're doing? So if you're doing this work, it's not about winning or losing. And it's never about winning or losing anyway. In Canada, this is actually maybe a misconception that folks might have. But you guys won't because you're law students. But you know the difference between the system in Canada versus in the states, right? So as a crown, your job isn't just to win at any cost; it's to make sure that the, the, the right result happens. Um, so there's a saying in civil uh, litigation, which is winning is only slightly better than losing. Um, 
you know, which I think speaks to just like how harrowing it is to go through the system, to be involved, to be from any point of view, but, you know, what I can speak to is just approaching it as a complainant and having to go through it. So I think that experience for that person can really be shaped by you, like as a crown, you can really impact that experience based on your approach to that person and how you're filtering, interpreting, presenting the system and how you're helping to lead that person through the system. Because what they're looking for is not a win or a loss. Like what they're looking for is to feel like they've been restored in some way or they've been healed in some way. They're, you know, they're not looking for something that can be answered from the legal system. It's something a bit more human than that. So I think being able to help someone through that to me is just like such a privilege and something that I really, um, you know, appreciate and respect, just appreciate being able to do that. So I think all those experiences have been uh, very impactful and meaningful for me. Yeah, it's a great answer. Um, it's interesting to hear you talk about feedback. You don't get a lot of feedback. I mean, sometimes from your colleagues, um, you know, the crowns or other defense lawyers might say, you know, good job in there or give you specific feedback, but you don't get a lot of feedback from the bench. And so when you do, uh, it's really valuable. And and they they talk. I mean, judges will tell you they talk just as much as the lawyers do about what happens in court. So it made me think of uh, a file I had in. You, at the beginning, I wouldn't have flagged this as one of sort of the memorable moments of my career, but it was, it was sort of really impactful um, because I had this municipal file, that same firm that I talked about, Newton and Associates also did municipal prosecutions. It's my only experience ever being on the prosecution side. And I think we had a, a dog ticket or something like that. And so the, the act, the municipal bylaws, whatever it was, the legislation, I had made a mistake and it was with a self rep and I had made a mistake and the, the mistake resulted in sort of the termination of the prosecution. I like couldn't go any further and wrote a brief to say why it wasn't such a bad mistake and tried to revive it, but it was done. And um, the judge <clears throat> at the end sort of called me back into the chambers and was just very, very kind and saying, you know, you're going to be a great lawyer. You have a good temperament for this. You know, mistakes are going to happen. And um, it wasn't a judge that I would have expected that from, which made it more impactful. And so I, I do think they they see you, you know, when you're trying and you're, you're working your hardest, especially as a young lawyer. And as long as you're not making those mistakes over and over again, I think you'll get a lot of respect from from the judiciary. Um, so that was an interesting moment for me, but I, it, the question made me think about the first murder file that I participated in as a second chair. I might've been two or three years at the bar, you know, had been asking, I, you know, I would suggest that you do that if you have the capacity to do it and sort of ask to get on a bigger file, uh, if you get, you know, the chance, because it's like running, you know, one, a one month murder trial is like running, you know, 20 or 30 provincial court trials just because there's so many applications and that was the first time that it hit home for me the you know the stakes of what we're doing where you have someone who has lost their life and their family is showing up every day and you have a client who is facing you know sort of life in prison as well and so um, the weight of those moments um, is not something that you forget and in that case you know, it's, you know, it's a reality, you know, you're going to, you're going to be in the room sometimes when, when sentences are handed down. And in that case, um, you know, a client got a life sentence for second degree murder and, uh, you know, you have to stand beside them, you know, you're there in that moment, which is, uh, very, very hard, but it's, it's also, you know, it's also why you do it because, you gave that person an opportunity to have, you know, their side of the story heard and you fought your hardest for them. And so to me, you know, that's really the moment where I'm like, okay, you know, this is, this is why we do this. And, um, you know, I'd say that those are the impactful cases that I remember. And, and then you go back to provincial and, and you start doing theft unders and like, oh, this is easy. You know, I could do this all day. And so there's a, a lot of value in those big files if you can get on them. Um, yeah. Okay, great. And was there any other questions from any of the students or the participants? Uh, please share them now or forever hold your peace. Um, I actually have a question, uh, if we have the time for it. 
Um, I'm just curious um, if our panelists have any advice for students, especially law students, either early on and early on in our careers too, especially as racialized uh, lawyers and law students, um, just for dealing, just for responding to instances of racism or instances of um, people having sort of closed mindedness when we don't really know the language or we don't know our knowledge enough to retort in a knowledgeable way or uh, to come up with a response that is, you know, backed by uh, case law, backed by the law, like backed by research. Um, if you just have any advice for how to approach that, um, just for us young ones. Yeah, it's a great question. It's okay in court. This is something I didn't learn for a long time. It's okay to say, whoa, can we stop here? You know, we need to take a break and we need to figure out what was just said and how I'm going to respond. It's okay to say, I need some time to figure out how I'm going to respond to that because, you know, it's something that needs to be responded to. You have this sort of duty as well to, you know, obviously put forward the best case on behalf of your client, but, you know, sometimes things get appealed as well. These are your words on the record, your response on the record. So I, the, the question to me was sort of in the context of in the courtroom. And I think that's one of the things I would say is it's okay to say, your honor, I'm going to need some time with that because I want to get, you know, it might be, I want to listen to the recording again of the words that were used. And I want to do some research on how I might respond to that. Now you can't do that every day in every provincial court case, but, you know, especially on the issue of race, especially where, you know, it might impact your client or you personally, you know, I think you have to be protective of that. And I think you have to, again, have sort of the, the moral courage to say, this is important enough for me to, to stop what's going on, to respond to this. And it could be something so slight that you don't realize it until a few minutes later. And, you know, I've, I've certainly been in that situation and some things I would rather have stopped the entire proceeding and tried to address it than, you know, think about it three months later and say, wow, I should have, I should have done something there because that sort of hit me in a way that I wasn't expecting. So it's okay to slow down and even stop and pause and adjourn. And I think young lawyers are so nervous about um, being the one who says, we need to, we need to stop here. We, you know, interrupting the proceedings. Um, but I, I would encourage you to, to do that if you, if you feel it's necessary. That's really interesting, uh, Sarah, because in your question, I heard both like the personal and the more, you know, in the courtroom element uh, to racism, but like my mind went to like the more personal aspect of like, how do I deal with racism that I know I'm going to encounter, right? Um, about which I have many thoughts. So I think, again, if you are a person who is here for this panel, you're probably someone who feels a lot of responsibility, um, you know, to represent to do the right thing, to not, you know, to fight what you need to fight. And so that leads to a lot of pressure. So I think, again, um, keep your perspective in mind, keep your expectations in mind and um, recognize in yourself that just your mere presence in this space where you're not, you know, you're maybe not really seen always, uh, certainly not recognized as you should, but just your presence alone is really powerful and it's really impactful. So, you know, like every morning before you go to work, like look in the mirror and say that to yourself. And also for everyone here, just your presence, like that applies to law school as well. Your presence in law school, just your presence is hugely impactful. It's very, very meaningful. I'm sure it doesn't feel like that sometimes, but it is. Just being there and being who you are and standing for what you stand for, that's really important. Like law school is not a place for positive reinforcement, right? Or for recognition of this, but like, I really believe that it's doing something. So in terms of when you're dealing with these um, moments, which unfortunately, inevitably, you know, they're gonna come up like on, on the personal side, I think it's really important, again, to center yourself, um, protect your energy and choose your battles. And it's okay to think a little bit about, you know, the choice of your battle. Like sometimes it takes a lot to, to figure that out. Is this something where you wanna fight? And sometimes that is the right choice. Or is this something where you're protecting your peace? Um, you know, and I will say that for myself, when I've had those experiences, I've really had a lot of support from my colleagues. So speaking with them, and it's really interesting because not everyone, like not everyone who's racialized is an ally, right? But also vice versa. Sometimes allyship can come from, come from unexpected places, like in my experience. So, you know, you can't assume, but I really have had folks um, help champion 
you know, my position. And that has been, you know, very moralizing, uh, very supportive. It really helped me a lot. So don't withdrawal, I think, don't close in, um, because it is such an isolating experience when you are, when you feel like you're being targeted and you're experiencing that, but um, try to get the support um, that you need and, you know, feel that you are worthy of that because you are. Well, thank you so much for the, those answers. They're very um, poignant. Um, I actually have a question too, because um, as much as we are all here, uh, mostly here from the racialized groups, um, the societies. There are uh, quite a number of allies here too that are non-POC. And um, currently there's a little bit of a discussion in the law school of um, non-racialized students supporting racialized students, especially in light of recent events that happened. Um, and I was just wondering what kind of uh, advice that you would give to non-racialized law students or lawyers and how can they support um, their colleagues or their um, their classmates? Yeah, I don't I don't know all the, the details or the context of, you know, what, what's gone on at the law school, but um, I don't know, people show you a lot about who they are through their actions or inactions. And um, Yan made a great point about, you don't always know where the allyship is gonna come from, but I, to me, you know, it's needed. We need people to support us. You know, it shouldn't, the burden shouldn't always be on the folks who are most impacted to lead and teach and respond, um, even though we're, we're definitely willing to do that and fight. Um, you know, it obviously makes it a lot easier when there's other folks coming in to, to support that. So in the profession, uh, you know, I came up in a time where a Black lawyer was under investigation by the Barrister Society, and we really had to look around and, and say, you know, who's supporting this lawyer? You know, why is this investigation so intense? You know, they're spending a million dollars on this. You know, it was a lot of questions, and and the profession, you know, showed me through that experience, you know, observing that experience that, oh, we, you know, we are still outsiders in this profession. That's the feeling that I got. Um, so, you know, I've had a, a lot of great colleagues and bosses who are, you know, white folks and uh, want to do the right thing often. Um, so I think it's, you know, that authentic, meaningful, they might not always say the right thing or do the right thing, but they will show up in a way that you know you can trust their actions uh, in the way that they support you so it's not not the best answer but it, that's what it made me think of it's like we're going to need you folks to step up and it doesn't always have to look perfect and you might mess up and you know, words that you choose but it's it's about more than that right you have to be willing to stand by and put your neck on the line right and that's a piece you know people will go to a certain point where they'll they'll say the right things because there's no consequences. Are you willing to take the risks that we have to take? Are you willing to give up the space that is needed for us to make meaningful change? That's when you start seeing people push back a little bit and that tension in this profession is that old boys club, you know, it still is. And some of those barriers are being broken down, but you know, that's, those are the folks who are leading the profession. And uh, I don't want to speak specifically about anybody, but you know, that vintage of lawyer are the lawyers who are, you know, decision makers now, or senior folks, or senior judges, and so, um, you know, those that's the the place that needs to change. And I think there is this movement amongst young young lawyers who recognize, you know, that that allyship is important. So, I'd be interested to hear what Ian thinks about that. No pressure. Um... So, well, Brandon, you make a lot of really good points. And I especially like what you said about, you know, um, I think you're kind of saying like, it's, you know, it'll be, it's an option. Like if you're not personally impacted, like you're an ally, you're not impacted. It always, you know, if you're impacted, you can't escape it, right? Like you're always, you know, people are always gonna see it in you, you can't get away. But if you're an ally, it's an option, it's a choice. You can choose to ally yourself or not. And you can make that choice continuously. It's always available to you. So I think, the, in the choosing, what's being shown there is your character um, and your principles. And I think 
definitely shifting the burden so that you're not, you know, putting all the the work on, you know, your friends, the folks who are experiencing this firsthand and just being proactive um, there can go a long way. I think centering the voices of the folks who are impacted by whatever's going on. I have, I've heard a little bit about what's happening in the law school, but you know, I can't speak to it with any authority. The sense that I get is there's a lot going on right now. So um, centering those voices and making space for that is really important. And I, I would echo Brandon, like that the sincerity in your intention will come through. It's okay if you don't know the, all the answers and you don't know what to do, you don't know what the right thing to do is. It's very difficult right now. There's a lot of messages out there. It's difficult to know what the right thing to do. And there is no single you know, answer for everyone. Like what someone needs, what one person needs may not be what another person needs. So I think having that sincere intention can go a long way. And I think also, um, support can look a lot of different ways. I mean, right now it sounds like there's a lot happening in the law school. So, you know, like buy your BIPOC friend a coffee, like bring them a snack. I'm serious, it's right. Like allyship comes in in all different um, shapes and sizes. So just doing anything to show that support and to show that you're there because having, like, having that acknowledgement, that validation can be really impactful as well. So yeah, centering voices, open heart, open mind. Thank you so much. And we have one question in the Q&A. Are you able to comment on regional dis difference, uh, on regional difference of racialized lawyers experience? If not, what might be unique about practicing in Nova Scotia? So I'm guessing both of you have mostly practiced in Nova Scotia. So I don't know if you could speak to other um, regions, but. No, that's interesting. I thought regional, you know, I, I thought the question was about rural parts of Nova Scotia, which there are a lot of differences. Um, you know, most of the, well, it's interesting, you know, think about the black community. There's 53 black communities, 52, 53 black communities in Nova Scotia that are all unique, have really interesting histories. And we don't necessarily learn a, a lot about them in school generally and not in law school either. Um, but through my work, you know, I've had the opportunity to sort of go to Whitney Pier and go to Shelburne and it is different. And, you know, it's some of those communities feel isolated. Uh, some of those communities feel like all of the resources and energy and attention is focused in, in Halifax and the HRM and they're out there on their own fighting. And so if you're a lawyer practicing in the, those areas as well, I think you're going to feel that uh, isolation in a different way. Um, at Legal Aid, we've we've had lawyers come and go from rural offices, and you know, on the Equity and Racial Diversity Committee that I was on, we would try to figure out, okay, well, what was the support network that you put in place for these folks who might be coming from out of province, coming from Ontario to go to Amherst, for example, where they might not see anyone who looks like them um, and might not have anyone to talk to. So really. Um, supporting those folks uh, if they feel isolated or even don't let them get to that point, like having those support systems in place before they start. I think uh, at Legal Aid, we could have done a better job of that. Uh, you know, so I certainly saw that, but across the country, it's really interesting too, you know, African Nova Scotians have 400 years of history. You know, that is the context here. And so that's a lot different than what we might see in Ontario where you, know, you might have sort of the more Caribbean communities uh, or different parts of the diaspora, you know, sort of um, dealing with issues as they've arrived in Canada and, and out West, it might look different, but, you know, at the Institute, at, you know, the African Nova Scotian Justice Institute, we've had people reach out from across the country. And so it's been interesting. We have this, this common fight that manifests itself in different ways across the country. So people in Quebec are calling and saying, you know, how do we stop street checks? You guys did it there. And we're like, well, it might look that way, but, you know, it's still an issue for us or or folks in B.C. saying, you know, come teach us how to roll out these urcas to our lawyers. So, um, yeah, anti-Black racism, you know, sort of manifests itself in so many different ways, depending on where you're at in this country. And um, there, that local resilience, though, that local expertise on on how to fight that has been sort of eye opening to me as I do this work. So. I sort of jumped around in the question, but it's a really interesting question. So it's interesting because for me, when I saw this question, I immediately thought about like the um, differences across different jurisdictions, so across the provinces in Canada. So I think um, speaking from 
uh, like an Asian Canadian perspective, I think that experience is, it is a regional difference. If you look at like the West Coast versus Ontario versus the East Coast, like you have a big difference in the, um, the history of the Asian Canadian communities there um, and the, you know, the timelines and so on. So, you know, have more representation, obviously, in, in just the population on the West Coast and then Ontario. However, that doesn't mean that, you know, there's more or less anti-Asian racism. I think, to me, it's just a different flavor. And again, that's, um, you know, more of my personal experience, my life experience, because I, I have only practiced uh, as a lawyer in Nova Scotia. So, you know, I'm extrapolating from my life experience to what I think the bars might be like and, you know, conversations with friends and so on. So you know, it's, yeah, I think it's a different flavor um, in Nova Scotia. Like we know that there's been an increase in anti-Asian racism since um, COVID, the pandemic, like there's a lot going on. Um, you know, right now, I'm the only uh, Asian crown in Halifax region. There are in the, uh, in the criminal bar, so including the defense bar, I feel like, let me think quickly, East Asian lawyers, I think of five off the top of my head, one other, one of them, one other of them is a woman. So it's the two of us, um, you know, I like I've shown up to court and been uh, mistaken. They're like, are you the interpreter? Like, who are you? Like, no, I'm a crown. Um, you know, like moments like that are really demoralizing. But uh, Daniel, I'm really glad you asked this question actually, because it gives me an opportunity to say this, which is what I was thinking about. Um, you know, like on a positive note, like I'm not sure if it really came across through the course of this panel, but I want what I wanted to say was, um, despite the challenges, or maybe in addition to or in parallel to the challenges, and this is going back to my point about having some really valuable good feedback from the bench and from colleagues and so on. I and Brandon's point, really valuable point about reputation. Your reputation really, really matters. I'm sure folks have said that to you guys before, especially in a smaller uh, bar like in Nova Scotia or in Halifax. Um, so if you were to ask me, and I think Faith, I've said this to you before, I really, I do feel like I have been given the opportunity to establish my own reputation. Um, and that's, you know, there's been difficulties there. There's a lot going on, but I, if you were to ask me, like, I wouldn't say that all of that, like all the oppression has been a complete bar on me being able to be like recognized for my work and to let my reputation speak for itself or like let my work speak for itself. So um, I think, you know, in a way there's a, there's a benefit to the, um, to Nova Scotia and like the, um, you know, kind of the regional situation here. I don't know if it's a benefit or a deficit, but anyway, overall, I, yes, my answer to that would be yes. And so that's something that I'm really grateful for um, and that I appreciate. Thank you both so much. And if there are no other questions, just gonna wait for like maybe a minute. I just wanna thank both of you so much for taking part of this panel. I don't know if Syria has any um, concluding thoughts as well, but I really wanted to thank both Syria and Kate as well for allowing me to put this panel on. Um, I really thought it would was um, an, an important panel to put on especially considering the context of criminal law. And because I am interested in criminal law and I'm a woman of color, I really wanted to know some of these answers as well. Um, I really wanted to thank Dosa Delsam Debosa for working together with me. It was quite an experience trying to work with four different societies for one panel, but we did it, so that was great. Um, and also we do have some gifts for you, but because it wasn't in person, I'm not able to get them to you right away, but I can get them to both of you. I know because I can see both of you. <laughs> also, Faith, um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for moderating. And something I forgot to mention at the beginning is that uh, Faith came up with the idea for this panel. I think it was the end of last year, um, if not the very beginning of this year. Um, and so I just wanted to thank you for, for your efforts and putting this on. And, and I'm really glad uh, that we were able to, to do this. Yeah, thanks to all for, for putting it on and for attending. And I would say if you have any interest in sort of the work that, that I've touched on or, or just want to ask more questions, feel free to reach out. 
um, African Nova Scotian Justice Institute. I think I think we have a website now, so that's exciting. My contact info should be on there, but um, I think students are such an asset, and they, you know, the earlier that you can get that crim law experience, the better uh, for you and figuring out what you want to do and and figuring out what crim law is all about. So, if I can help in any way, feel free to reach out. Absolutely. Um, the same for me. If there's anything, I'm always really happy to chat with students. Um, so you can reach out to me. Um, how uh, you can find me on LinkedIn or my email at cn.lu at novascotia.ca. Um, or Faith, if you want to um, distribute my contact information, that's totally fine with me. Um, so thank you so much to the organizers for putting this on. Thanks, Brandon, for being on the panel with me. Um, and thank you so much to the participants. Remember, if you are a law student, of color, then take a moment to celebrate your presence and congratulate yourself for your presence. And if you're an ally, buy your friend a coffee. Those are my takeaways. Thank you everyone so much. Also, this recording will be available within the next couple of days. Uh, but in the meantime, if you have any questions um, for the panelists that you think of maybe overnight, you can email dclsa at hotmail.com um, and we can forward those off to, uh, to whoever. And if that's all, um, have a good night, everyone. Good night.